Hey guys, welcome back. And today's video is all about poo. It's about poo and turds. Actually, it's not really. It's actually about IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome. But I do talk a lot about poo today. So I'm just warning you, if you don't want to hear it, you don't want to learn about this, then it's probably time to tune out. But it's very educational, so you should probably listen. So what is irritable bowel syndrome? What are the causes? And how should you manage your symptoms? Today, I'm going to cover all of these things. And I'm also going to do a second part to this video, which covers things just in a lot more detail. So please stay tuned for that. So IBS is the abbreviation of irritable bowel syndrome, like I mentioned before. And it's a fairly common disorder or dysfunction that affects our large intestine. The signs and symptoms of IBS can vary in severity, but they'll also differ between people. So the most common symptoms of IBS include things like cramping, abdominal pain, bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation, but sometimes even both. So IBS is considered a chronic condition. So by definition, it's been present for more than one year. And if you're experiencing these types of symptoms, but only on rare occasions, then it's unlikely that you have a true case of IBS um, because the infrequency doesn't quite meet the prerequisites for a formal diagnosis. So what causes IBS? Well, the exact reason is actually unknown. However, there are a number of factors that appear to play a fairly important role. And I'll list these now. So the first is actually increased gut motility. So the walls of our intestines are lined with layers of muscles that kind of contract as they move food through our digestive system. Contractions that are really strong or last longer than normal, and this is also known as hyperactive gut, can cause excess gas, bloating, as well as diarrhea. On the flip side, weak intestinal interactions, and I would refer to this as like a sluggish GI, and that's what I have, uh, means that the passage of food is significantly reduced, and that can lead to hard and dry poo. So yes, today we're all about the poo guys. Like I said, you're just gonna have to hang out with me. So the second one is dysfunction of our nervous system. So dysfunction or sensitivity of the nerves in our GI may actually cause you to experience greater than normal discomfort when your abdominals or abdomen stretches. Um, and that can be caused by gas or large amounts of food. Poorly coordinated signals in the brain and the intestine can also cause your body to overreact to changes that occur as a normal part of that digestive process. And that can result in pain, diarrhea, and constipation. We often even hear people refer to the gut brain axis. So people with IBS can be hyperactive or hypersensitive to these disconnections between our brain and our gut. Who's had a severe infection? Well, IBS can also develop after severe infections or even after a case of diarrhea, which is caused by bacteria or a virus. It can also be associated with a bacterial overgrowth in our intestines. And that's often why we'll be recommended to have a stool sample um, taken during the early investigative stages of IBS. Another factor is changes to our gut microbiome. So who's recently taken an antibiotic? So yes, they're highly effective for reducing pathogenic bacteria, but they can also wipe out many of the good microbes in our gut. And sudden changes to the bacteria or the fungi or viruses that are naturally present in our GI may actually be linked to IBS. Even the way that we are delivered at birth might be a potential cause for the development of IBS in later life. And this is due to its influence on our gut microbiome. Interestingly, research has actually shown that there are significant differences in the gut microflora of people who are delivered by a vaginal birth and those who are delivered by a cesarean birth. And we also know that the gut microbes in people with IBS are often different to those who are actually healthy. The last factor that might be a consideration for the development of IBS is early life stress. So people that have been exposed to stressful events, especially during childhood, are also or tend to report more symptoms of IBS. Okay, so let's have a look at the different subtypes of IBS. So there are four different categories and these include IBS-C, IBS-D, IBS-M and IBS-U. So IBS-C is predominantly a symptom of constipation. 
hence C, IBS C. Uh, IBS D is predominantly diarrhea. So IBS M is mixed, meaning that you can have both constipation and diarrhea. And then IBSU um, basically just means undiagnosed. And we usually use that term if somebody presents themselves uh, as having IBS, but their subtype hasn't actually been formally diagnosed. So who can actually help you diagnose IBS? Well, a dietitian or a gastroenterologist are the two best medical professionals uh, who can help you determine which of these subtypes best describe your symptoms and provide you with a formal diagnosis. And something that you might like to consider prior to your appointment with a healthcare professional is to actually monitor and record your daily bowel movements. And you can do this with what's called a Bristol stool chart. My poo! <laughs> so what should my poo look like? So the type of stool depends on the time that it actually spends in your colon. So after you go to the bathroom, what you see is basically a result of your diet, fluid, potentially some medications and your lifestyle. So this chart shows us seven categories of poop. Every person has different bowel habits. However, a normal poo should be soft and easy to pass. So like the types three and four that you can see on this chart. Types one and two, however, would suggest that you have constipation while types five through seven might indicate that you have some diarrhea. So once you know what subtype we're dealing with here, it becomes much easier to help manage your symptoms. So another question I'm often asked is how often should I be going to the bathroom? So I have heard many times like, oh, eat this and it'll help keep you regular. But what is regular and how do we define normal? So it's really common for people to go to the bathroom once a day, but it's also still normal if you go more or less frequently. So what's more important or most important is the type and the ease at which you poo. And this can happen as frequently as one to three times per day or as infrequently as three times per week. So to be given a formal diagnosis of IBS type C, which is the constipation type predominant, by definition, you would be going to the bathroom less than three times per week. But for a diagnosis of IBS-D subtype, you'd be experiencing bathroom trips, poos, uh, greater than three times per day. So yes, being regular is one thing and great work if you are, but what are some other signs of healthy bowel habits? Number one, you should be able to at least hold on for a short time after you feel the urge to go to the toilet, but you also should be able to go within about a minute of sitting down. So the second thing would be that you need to be able to pass it easily without pain and you shouldn't be straining or struggling to go or pass anything that's really hard and dry. Number three is you should also be able to completely empty your bowels when you go to the toilet and you shouldn't be running back to the toilet shortly after to go again. So you're probably wondering how I should be managing my symptoms or what can I do to treat this? Well, unfortunately there isn't a one size fix all treatment, but there are definitely many things that we can do to manage these symptoms. So I'm going to record all of those in another video guys. So please stay tuned for that. It'll be coming to you shortly on either IGTV or YouTube and I will see you next week with more poo. <laughs> yeah! <laughs>